Hey, everybody. Welcome. We're going to give you all a few minutes to filter in here, and then we'll start in just a minute. Thanks for joining us. So I think we're probably about ready to get started. Um, so I'm going to do a quick intro. Uh, good evening. My name is Maggie McKay. I'm the executive director of Vidiots Foundation, the female founded and helmed nonprofit video store and soon to be cinema here in Los Angeles. Um, I'm really delighted to welcome you all to this very special, special conversation with celebrated director, producer, amazing cinematographer, Kirsten Johnson, filmmaker of the profoundly moving Dick Johnson is dead. Um, Crystal will be joined tonight by moderator Caroline Labrasco, our friend, a film curator, producer, program strategist, and acquisitions consultant who recently wrapped 18 years at Sundance as a head programmer and director of the Catalyst program. Um, we're really excited to have Kirsten and Caroline here. And I'll just quickly start with some thank yous. Um, I just want to thank Kirsten for her exquisitely beautiful film, um, which adds to a filmography we deeply admire and respect and are very proud to have in the Vidiots Library. Um, it means a lot to have work like Kirsten's in our library and uh, makes us very happy to share it. Um, I also want to thank Netflix um, for, and to, for letting us host this event. Um, we love this movie. It has had a profound effect on um, me and my family and so many of our colleagues who've seen it. So thank you for having us. And um, I just wanna let you know, we're gonna have um, Caroline and Kirsten talk for a little while, and then we really wanna open this up to you. Um, so what you're gonna do is simply type your questions into the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your screens. And then we'll do our best to relay those questions and to get as many in as time permits. And I think with that, I'm ready to stop talking and invite Kirsten and Caroline to turn on their videos and audio and join us. Thanks, everybody. Hi, Maggie. <laughs> Maggie. Bye, bye. <laughs> I'll leave it to you. Kirsten, I'm so happy to be here with you and feel lucky, actually, especially because, I mean, we talked about the film, we've talked about the film a number of times. I think the last time was in April or on another panel, actually. And a lot has, like COVID has persisted and we're in a place of grief, you know, as a nation, like that's so settled so in. And so when I rewatched Dick Johnson and his dad today, um, it just, it hit me in a totally new way, actually. And, um, but I just wanna, I just wanna establish for, for our audience. I love, I loved, I always take a look at like reviews and writing on a film before I talk to a filmmaker. And I just picked out a few of the amazing adjectives that, that a, for a film that is impossible to define really, but it, it's been called by the press, audacious, charming, profound, slapstick, surreal, dark, light, <laughs> cinematic, experimental, and here's the best, unlike any documentary that's come before. And um, <laughs> very cool set of words. And I love how, I love how in a weird way they, it's, it's, it's like, it's all those things and many of those things can't almost cancel each other out. And so you, I feel like the reason why I keep now I've watched it three times, you know, and each time, like, it's impossible for me to fully grasp what it's doing because, mm -hmm. but, but you do, as, as somebody who has um, been navigating my own grief about my, the death of my parents, which I've told you about, this movie touches into places that are ineffable for me um, that we can't really talk about, you know, that you, you just get at something. 
And I think that's maybe why all the adjectives kind of circle around a bunch of ideas, but never, you know, like they, they it's, it's, it's impossible to define your film in a way, in a way. Ooh. Isn't that the, <laughs> that is, maybe that is like the purpose of our art form, you know, is that we don't have to, it doesn't have to be on the nose. It can be metaphoric. It can be elusive. It can, it can touch into ineffable feelings because it's all of those different mediums together, sound, you know, visuals, um, character, uh, time happening, um, make-believe, you know? And I wondered if you could tell, I just feel like you're somebody who really thinks about the form. I mean, this film, like your other films, talks about, actually talks about documentary form. But can you, can you reflect a little bit on the ineffable and kind of the way that our art form kind of touches into something that we can't speak of. Oh, I love the word that you added, make believe. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, to make believe that somehow, you know, cinema could stop death and stop dementia. Like that is like the ultimate form of make believe, right? And, um, yeah. Yeah. you know, the ineffable, like I just, you know, my dad, like I have my dad here on a stick, right? But but like, what is it like, the whole time I was making the movie, I felt like I was running after, sort of desperately running after the fact I was too late, like I'd already lost him. Yeah. And yet, wrong, I was wrong, <laughs> right? The whatever is ineffable about his spirit is still alive in him and somehow it's alive in the movie. And yet, you know, he doesn't know where he is. He doesn't know that we've made this movie at this point, right? Like, but, you know, I got off the phone with him today and one more time he said, I just want to make sure you know I love you. Oh. And it's just like, oh. okay, it's boiled down. There it is. That's it. I just want to make sure you know I love you. And, and, and you know, the other day when I called, my dad is now in a dementia care facility and that transition was incredibly difficult and it happened late in the summer um, and in many ways because of the pandemic, um, but also because his dementia had advanced. Um, but dad's like weaving events of current history into, you know, the way he's making sense of the world. So when I called the other day, he said, oh, are you calling from Mars? How is it up there? Had he read the news? because they've been watching the rover had landed right and i felt far away to him but he was delighted he was like how did you get this good connection from mars and wow. yet, right and but that's what this is right like we're trying to like to make telephone connections um into the future and the past and like you know you caroline like in the grief of losing your parents like you're trying to find these ways to communicate with them still. And they somehow are communicating with you still. I mean, I remember after my mom died, I kept like having this urge, like I needed to make a phone call. And I'd be like, I can't remember who I'm supposed to be calling. And then I'd sort of pick up my phone and then I'd start to dial. And then I realized I was dialing our home number and I was trying to call my mom, like, you know, beyond the grave. And I think this is what, Cinema is like, sometimes I think like cinema is a cemetery, you know, cemetery is a cemetery of people. Um, yeah. You all may hear in the background, my family's outside doing movie night and they're watching um, <laughs> Alfred Hitchcock movies from the 1930s, his British films. Everyone in those movies is dead. Yeah. Everyone's dead in them, but like we're all gripped with their aliveness and, and you know, what's ineffable is, is what is this? How do we keep communicating with the people we love? And yeah. then, and it's, and it's like, we meet people who we fall in love with, right? Like you watch a movie and you fall in love with a person on the screen who you want to know more about, Yes. right? Mm -hmm. And then you seek out their films and you learn more about them and, you know, you, you keep, you keep learning about them. Um, you know, I, I, had a prof I, I had this, I have this amazing film professor guru who taught me about what is, what is, 
truly what is so powerful in this film thing like and he he had this theory that actually when you go into close up when you're in a in a movie theater and the screen is 30 feet high or 40 feet high or whatever it is mm -hmm. and you go into close up you and there's a face that's this close the last time you were that close in that position was with at your mother's breast i had a very um <laughs> amazing experience um, recently with some students in North Carolina and um, they were they were together they were in a theater but they were distanced apart wearing masks and I was really big on the screen mm -hmm. and then they walked up to the computer and they asked me questions but I think my head was that big right and they had their you know when the person would come up to ask me the question their back would be to the audience and, and I sort of realized the same thing in that moment. It's like the first time I've ever thought of it. I'm like, oh, I, and, and they were talking to me like I was the Wizard of Oz or something. Like You were in a way. Yeah, I was like this big head who was sort of like going, we were like going deep into, I mean, they were revealing just amazing things um, about their parents and life and death, but they, they were in the intimacy of the giant me head Yes. They're back to all the people and it felt intimate, right? And and I think that's what's just, I mean, that often happens with camera work, right? The, the camera propulses you into people. You can sort of get in and see their eyeballs, right? Um, so you're in this deeply intimate spatial relationship that you wouldn't be without the lens. But this also happens with screens and projections, right? And so we change scale in relation to each other. Um, and scale is another scale is another magic trick of cinema that I didn't even mention, right? Sound, vision, image, time. Cinema has so many magic tricks. It's um, so multidimensional in that sense. Do you, um, my God, this is a really fun conversation. And I realized like already like 10 of our 20 minutes has gone by. Um, I Time, always time. ticking. <laughs> I mean, you get at something so profound that is also ineffable. It's almost like you're tapping into something unconscious for both your father and yourself. And I just wanna delve a little bit into the, the, film, the creative process of making the film, if that's okay. And um, like dying to know, I, I mean, the first question I had when I watched the film was like, how did this evolve? I imagine it was changing and evolving each day that you were shooting, but like, I know that it was production, in production it was evolving, obviously in editorial it was evolving. What was the first idea that you had for this movie or did it come fully out of your head like Aphrodite out of Zeus's brow? Or <laughs> like how, how, did it, how did it emerge? It did, not, it did not spring fully formed. Okay. That I promise you, that did not happen. <laughs> um, but it did spring, it sprung from camera person in the freedom I gave myself. Right. The freedom to yeah, just- Say more about that, yeah. Like what well, was the- I mean, just, you know, I, I you know, as you know, <laughs> Caroline knows because I, you know, I, I struggled for many years to make a film. I sent it to Sundance when it was a film about Afghanistan. And Caroline was like, I'm really sorry, KJ, but like, this is not getting into Sundance. And I was like, what? How can that be? But then that film was like dying and becoming camera person. And that, you know, film had to die because the girl who was in it, the, the main protagonist of the film was too afraid to be in the film. She thought it would be dangerous for herself to be in the film. Yeah. And, and we had to like go through this process of, of stripping her out of the film, just taking away her face, leaving her voice. And then the film just like inverted itself and became camera person. And that was such a crazy process that went on over the course of six years. And it was me working with 25 years worth of footage. And at a certain point, I was just like, I don't even know if this is a movie. I'm just going through this process of trying to address all of these questions I have about documentary camera work. And I have so many questions. I'm just putting them all into this thing. And we worked and we worked on it to the point where it's like, we didn't even know people would be able to understand it. Yeah. But we knew that we had 
filled it with all of my questions and that was all we could do. And then we put it out into the world and people were like, wow, we've never seen anything like this before. And I was like, yeah, I hadn't either. Like yeah. I didn't recognize camera person was foreign to me. It didn't look like anything I, I was capable of making even, which and is so strange. How did you know to trust what was coming out in your questions? I didn't, I didn't. I mean, it was scary and we didn't trust it. And we had, we were just filled with doubt. I mean, I, it, it really, at the end, it was Marilyn Ness, the producer, Daniel Varga, who also worked on it as a producer, is just a, emerging into an extraordinary producer, working with Brett Story and Nels Bangerger. And the four of us- Being the editor, right? The editor you yeah. worked with again and yeah. again, with whom you worked on Dick Johnson and Marilyn, with whom you worked on Dick Johnson as well. Absolutely. I like, I like finding amazing people and then like going deeper with them. Um, but the four of us, we all were like, exhausted and sort of exhilarated like we knew we'd done what we could but i have never been more filled with doubt taking a film out into the world and we really thought like mm, nobody's gonna get it and we were so wrong <laughs> and something about that felt very freeing to me it's just like i have no idea what the audience needs or will understand but i if i leave space for them in the movie and i trust them and just do what I need to do <laughs> and like ask my most like crazy questions. I think the audience is with me because we're all in this crazy world together, right? Yeah. Yeah, and we're all, in a way we're all camera person, right? We're all looking out and we're all grieving our parents and loss. In, and, in advance or- in advance And trying to memorialize, trying to imbue memorials with life. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Does, I, yeah, go ahead. So t say more about, so how did that freedom then take, take flight in the making of Johnson? So the freedom was like, okay, I'm going to stop pretending to know things. Okay. I, I'm, I, I'm going to lean into trust. Like I trust this man, trusted him all my life and he trusts me. So we're going to trust that. <laughs> and I know I cannot, I am incapable of handling his dementia without humor. Like I just can't do it. Cause I feel like, you know, the, my mother's Alzheimer's was like seven years of tears. And I was just like, I, I don't have it in me to cry for seven years again. <laughs> like I can't do it. You know, it does feel like you and your dad just like made this tacit agreement to just laugh, both of you. <laughs> oh my goodness, we totally did. And you know, Ray DeMazzo, who's his best friend, who's like weeping at the end. Yeah. yeah. He was he was at the Sundance premiere and he was like, I made this film. I went there emotionally. The two of you, you were just giggling through the whole movie. And this is life and death. <laughs> He's so great. The designated, what's it called in a family? The designated like emotional one. <laughs> Right, 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 right. You know, he's like, he's like, he's like, I'm 91. This is real for me. <laughs> yeah, it hit him differently. Yeah. So you trusted, you started with trust of you and Dick. You and you yeah. trusted yeah. Dick, Dick trusted you. And yeah. then did you like, did you guys have did you and Nels and and Marilyn and Katie like come together all the time and and, re so, and so, process and come out with something new and then go out and shoot that and then come back? Was well, it so, so what happened was like the first like the, the light bulb was like the comedy of my dad sitting up in the dream and being like, I'm Dick Johnson, I'm not dead yet. Like the sort of comedy of him coming back to life. And that has lots of resonance in my life as it does in everybody else's. Like, you know, I was raised on Jesus and the resurrection. Mm -hmm. uh, the, yeah. At my grandmother's funeral, there was an open casket and a lady at the funeral, attending the funeral was wearing the same dress my grandmother was in the casket. So like we all like, dissolved into a world of giggles at the end of my grandmother's funeral. Um, you know, there's the moment in Dick Johnson where my mom, like Nils cut my mom's footage after looking at her box of ashes. So she sort of came back to life, right? So this idea for me, like cinema can do this because it can move on the timeline. It can like do the before and after, put the after before the before, right? Um, so all of that like came in like a flash with the dream that I had. And then I was like, 
Oh, the funeral. We can do the funeral. You can kill him again and again. Yeah. But the, but the, the, the first idea was the funeral, the real funeral in our family's church with his real friends um, in the sort of making a theater out of this sacred space that had been my family's sacred space and where my mother had her funeral. Um, yeah. Yeah. Where did you, where, where were you, where did the services happen for your synagogue? Uh, we're Jewish. And yeah. were you able to have, I mean, it all happened pre pandemic. You were able to do it yes. in the synagogue. Yes. And was it, pandemic. was it in the same synagogue for both of them? No. Um, long story, but I'll yeah. call you another time. But yeah, so they weren't together. So. And, and was it, were either the synagogues, the synagogues of your childhood? No. Right. So there's a real disconnect, which is, I, I think it's what's so amazing about it being the, the church of your childhood and of your mother's funeral yeah. is that there's already so many layers of meaning happening there. And if you paste add on a kind of a, almost like a humorous reenactment, then, then all of a sudden there's all this meaning. Right? That's right. That's right. And I think that's what I trusted from the beginning of like, these things will resonate. They must. Like if there's something honest going on for you and, yeah. and, real and vulnerable, like there has to be something for others to resonate with. And, and, and the transgression, the chutzpah, the like, the defiance, like, I mean, I can tell you, like, I was a really yes. believing little kid. I believed God could read my thoughts. And I sat, I was in that church every Saturday. We weren't Jewish. We were Seventh-day Adventists, but I was there every Sabbath. Shabbat. <laughs> and I dreamed of like, I imagine like going up to the front and doing crazy things at the front and like always theatricalizing it. You were always, I had daydreams in that space every Saturday of my childhood, you know, cause I was bored or I was caught up in the sermon or whatever. Right. But when I think about it, like my imagination was always going, I was thinking about eternity. I was thinking like, what'll happen if I get to heaven when I'm seven years old? Do I have to stay there? You know, so all of that was going on in my playing head. Out. Playing out. Yes, playing out. And so that then suddenly this idea that we could play some of this out in yeah. public in this space. And that just like, you know, it just it, it just erupted in my mind of like, oh, this is on. Like, this is so on. So we um, actually got... Um, you know, we talked to people about the idea, we're going to kill my dad over and over and everyone's like <laughs> laughed and horrified and whatever, but nobody was giving us money to do that. They were just like, KJ, are you okay? Like everyone was a little bit like, oh, KJ is a little. Um, but then I got this wonderful call from Priya Swami Nathan and, and Caroline, like I do, we are talking. <laughs> You know, not everyone listening is a woman. Um, not everyone who's a part of video videos is a woman. You're, we are not only concerned with women, um, but you and I know um, that there has been changes in our industry. And it didn't used to be that there were as many women in power as there are now. And most of like my big leaps forward has been like women reaching out to me and being like, are you ready to come forward into the next level? Um, and that was Priya um, in this case, who- Higher ground. Yeah, she's higher ground now. At the time she was with Annapurna and she had seen camera person mm -hmm. and she found out some way to get in contact with me. And she said, hey, I just want to tell you like what I think about your film. And it was like one of those like, Oh my God, she really gets camera person. And then she said, what are you thinking about? What are you doing next? And I said, I, you know, I've got this crazy idea. And she laughed and she was like, did you know that I produced one of the jackasses, you know? And, <laughs> and I was like, no, I was like, the jackass, jackass is a total inspiration. Um, but so she, she listened to me and she said, let's get the money together to do the funeral. That's all I can figure out how to do for you, but let's do that. And then we did it. So then we had this proof of concept and what an exhilarating experience to do that. It was so meaningful on so many different levels. Um, and then there was sort of a year period where it was sinking in to me, like my dad really has dementia. Like, yeah. And so we were trying to pitch the film and sell the film, not getting traction. And I'm watching my dad like going down and 
that was so hard. That was just like, ah, oh, it's like right within reach, but I'm gonna- Running after it, as you said. And, like, and, and that was the metaphor for everything. I'm just sort of running behind, desperately it's running behind. It's kind of a slapstick move, right? It's like you- It really is. Right? You're like bump, 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 bump. And it's, you know, and it's just like the little Buster Keaton, like running down the hill, <laughs> giant balls following him, you know? So Monty Python, right? All you, of it. All of it. <laughs> I'm going to go to some of our beloved questions. Forgive me, people, panelists. I mean, uh, Vidiot's audience. I, I've been so wrapped up that I, okay, wait. Um, we're having a fun one. We're, we're like in the thick of it. I'll keep talking and then you just like tell me to stop. And here's one. Here's one. Have you gotten any responses from audiences about their own family members with dementia? Like, and what they <laughs> feel and what did it mean for them? I'm going to turn on my light, by the way, because the light. I don't cool. mean to laugh out loud at your question, uh -huh. beloved audience member, but like people are pouring out their human experience to me. And, you know, I think it would have been even more so if we had you know had a year where we could be in person you know i, I certainly at sundance and at true false the only two times i showed the film in the theater that, that must have been, that's a loss for so many this year but yes well it, you know we just lost the community of cinema and then the chance for people to walk up afterwards and tell me like, you know both my wife's parents my parents we had dementia for 19 years i mean people just were like pouring out their guts about dementia because i really think um the pain that people experience um losing people they love is um mostly kept private yeah you know and um you know we all know people die our parents are supposed to die before us uh but when it happens like you know i mean caroline i know you're st you're still in the like your magical thinking phase, right? Like it's like crystal if I look at pictures. Maybe she'll be in the next room. Yeah, and that all of a sudden you're just gonna cry and you don't know why. And you know, it, it, it's it's hyper real. Grief is like hyper real, um, and just the so so. I think what is meaningful to me is that um, there's so many people who are suffering in silence and are invisible to us on in all kinds of ways, obviously, right? Like people right. in prison, people working in forced labor camps to produce products, you know, all of these different ways where they're like, people suffering is like made invisible. And, um, you know, I think grief is, is, it's kind of beyond us all. Like we can all be like, I can accept death until it's like the person you really love. <laughs> and then you're like, it's unacceptable. It is so wrong. It's so wrong. It's so Wait, wrong. I, I want to follow. I want to ask this yes. question from yes. this yes. Love love person. We'll share. Right. So Love this there. person is making a film about their parent with dementia. Their father died yeah. last year, and they ask, from your experience making Dick Johnson is dead, do you have any tips on how to ensure that the quality time you share with your dad? isn't overshadowed by the technical and creative hurdles in the making of the film like this. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, you know that for yourself, right? You know, you know what's needed in the time that you have, you know what's the unexplored territory that's waiting to be explored. Um, you know, my dad and I just like have fun together and with his looping, it's like, we have the same fun again and again. He's like, have I told you that you're a great daughter? I'm like, yes, you have, dad. It was the 13th time today. You know, like, and, but, but we still, he'd be like, oh, you must be really getting sick of that. I'm like, I really am, dad. He's like, but do you know how much I love you? You know, like, so, dad, you don't get sick of. <laughs> but, you know how much you get sick of that, right? But, but so, I mean, I just, I think what, I, I guess would, would be the tip is um, trust that um, you are creating evidence of your relationship and you don't fully understand it yet. So don't try to be in the future, try to be in the present. Um, but obviously like making a movie is always 
doing that back and forth between the future and present. Like, how am I gonna get the movie made? What's the movie gonna be? You know, you're always jettisoning towards the future. And it's just like, just keep bringing yourself back and be in the present. And you can, you can do your time travel in the edit room. Mm -hmm. Just try to be in the moment with that person. And dementia is like incredible for that. Like it will force you to be in the present like every second. Like that's, that's what it does. Dementia is like, this is the present. You thought a minute ago made sense? No, this is the present. So, so I just think in some ways it's just really miraculous because the filming and being in that present moment that can become, can become really hard to just be in the loop with a person who doesn't have any distinction between past, present, and future. Um, and the camera sort of helps you just like be interested in really the very present moment. Mm -hmm. So I would say like, enjoy your father, enter his present time space with the camera with you and you will later discover how huge it is. So interesting, there's all these things conspiring to ask you to be in the present, the dementia, the camera. Um, That's right. Yeah. That's right. It's really interesting. And, and, and I think what is the most challenging when we make films is our own shame, you know, our own fear about it won't be good enough, mm -hmm. it won't have value, I've started too late, it's, it's ruined, it's too small, I don't recognize all these things. And it's just like, you know, it's like any in any creative endeavor, like you just like dial down those negative voices. Like if you could do that a little bit, and just There's more room for the, the present too, right? Yeah, that's right. And did you, I mean, you put yourself in this movie and in your last movie, do you, how do you feel about sharing really vulnerable like thoughts and moments of your own self? You know, it's so deep and crazy. Like, I mean, I would have never, yeah you know 20 years ago never put myself in a film and then camera person transformed me because i didn't think i was in that footage and then i realized like oh there's all this evidence of me it is not all of me it is fragments of me it is pieces of me and i think once again back to the fear or the shame or the fear of criticism yeah. we don't want to be revealed because then we will be judged or found lacking but in fact, if you like put out there that I, I have vulnerability, I'm not sure, there are contradictions, um, I make mistakes, um, I'm just trying. If you put yourself out there like that, people are, it's just like people are incredibly kind to you <laughs> and you haven't put your full self out you still have your privacy, you still have your own intimacy, like nothing is going to take away what I have from yeah. 55 years with this man. Like not. this movie couldn't hurt us. I could only betray him by making a lousy movie. <laughs> and that, that was scary, but but he would have forgiven me that. Is My he, father would have forgiven me that. Sure. There was right? no way he could really hurt him because he it was- It didn't matter to him. He, he, like, he, he trusts you anyway. He knows who you are. In that's the, right. The film, that's what it's been, he would have been forgiving yeah. of like, oh, it didn't turn out that funny. Well, it's, it's hard to make this a funny movie, KJ. You know, like that would have been, that would have happened. There's so many amazing questions. Oh my God. Um, read a bunch of them. Okay, I'm gonna read a bunch of them, so, uh, one after another, and then like we, you can pick and choose. The film is so beautiful. Do you think documentary is the right term for it? Then there's a question, um, how did you dream up the fantasy elements, the giant heads, the art direction and magical, um, those as, how did those segments take shape? Um, and um, I'm developing a series that explores the experience of aging from a range of angles. This was obviously a strong reference. Very curious what projects you referenced when putting this together. Like what, what yeah, what did you look at? That's mm. interesting. Um, what, or where you found inspiration. Um, mm. uh, so, so I love the question about like, is this a documentary? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, for me, I like to use many words for things. It's an experiment. It's a dream. It's a hallucination. It's like a love letter. It's a, you know, you could just go on and on and on, right? Like, yep. 
because we're allowing many things to be simultaneously. I desperately don't want my dad to die, but I'm killing him, <laughs> right? <laughs> because you do it. <laughs> you know, right, exactly. And I, and I want sudden deaths because I'm so sick of this like degenerative disease taking so long, right? Like I'm so angry at the dementia, like I'm just gonna like Get over my father back together again. So so all of those kind of contradictions, I think um for me, I I was trying to let those things lead me. So for example, in the imagination and production design of heaven and hell, it was like, okay, so fantasy, what is my father's fantasy? To get to eat chocolate ice cream all the time. Uh, you know, like have his chair, be comfortable. Uh, so I ask, you know, ask him what his wishes are. He wants his, he wants toes. Really? That's all he wants. Okay. Let's give him to him. You know, so it's just like these sort of playing with these ideas and then realizing like, oh, my mom can't be there. He would want, he wants my mom to be there. Okay. So how do we get my mom there? It's like, okay, we get my mom there as an image. What, what's the form of that? And then, you know, I'm like, I love like Saul Steinberg, you know, like, like the people like who put paper bags on people's heads and drew pictures on them. Right. Like, and you go into the rabbit hole of like masks and yeah. the delirium of that is so joyful that all of a sudden you're like, Ooh, okay. So our heads are going to be big. And then who's it going to be? And then, you know, and, and those things just build on themselves and the, idea to do it in slow motion came out of how do we inhabit the present time more? How do we stretch our oh. in the present time, right? Because my dad would like, that's, that's so what, interesting. Right? That's what slow motion is, is, is stretching the present. Yeah, you're stretching time. Wow. So, right? So my dad who would, <laughs> would, who would ask, what are we doing, you know, every 30 seconds, if you're filming at such you know, slow speed that the he then is just smiling. Mm. You know, like my dad can't act his way out of a paper bag, but like we got a moment of surprise by filming in super slow mo <laughs> that really works, right? Because <laughs> we caught like something that was a fraction of a second and then we expanded it. Mm -hmm. But once we did that, that led to like, oh, feathers float, bubbles float, confetti floats, what's beautiful in slow motion, you know, like, mm -hmm. oh, pom poms are beautiful in slow motion. So it just, it would just like one thing would sort of lead to another. And then it's like, oh, well, Jesus is going to be pouring water on my father's feet. You know, it just, it would, it just was generative of ideas. But was so beautiful, Caroline, was that we, we had a thing we figured out with Maureen Ryan, who produced those scenes and you know we are encouraged to believe in fiction film production that we need to know everything in advance that that's the way to be responsible as a filmmaker right to storyboard it <laughs> i was storyboard one storyboard it yeah storyboard it spend the amount of money you promised you'd spend do it in the amount of time that you did get all the shots you're supposed to get right yeah. In this case, I had a main protagonist. I didn't know if he could do anything. Mm -hmm. So it was like, how do we create a process where we show up and have all of these different elements and this person who's, we can't even know if he's gonna be in his marks. Like we can't even know if this is going to be in focus, yeah. but we're doing it. And the slow-mo makes it like the slow-mo extended the present, but then it made focus super hard. So it was like, we, we knew we were getting these like fractions of seconds of things, but we also knew we're filming behind the scenes. So like, that's the story too. So it's just like building like, okay, there's an obstacle. Let's find a way to address it. And each response to each obstacle built a new thing, but I've never felt more like I was on a documentary set than in that fictional world. It, it was the same thing of discovery and responding. Yeah, it was really cool. <laughs> I loved it. Really cool. <laughs> God. Um, how are we doing vidiots, my vidiots leaders, fearless <laughs> leaders? It's it is 10 after six. We've gone now for we've got time. We got time. They're like we're, we're only 35 minutes in, so we can talk a few. Okay, yeah. we've got more 
questions. Okay, great. Let's keep going. This is beautiful. Well, you know, just to say, like, I feel like I was taught that I should pretend to know things in order to be a filmmaker. Yeah, why is that? And and I think because I think it's like mastery, hierarchy. There's one giant genius at the top who happens to be a man who is in control of everything. We're hiding the fact that things are collaborations and that people bring things, right? And losing the discovery. We're losing so much richness by thinking that because and you don't have the like you don't process pro out of process. Right. Process That's itself right. is is the journey like hello That's right and if you build that into your filmmaking set like here's another thing i was like i want to like meet get to know understand why each person on this crew um what they feel about death who they're afraid of losing um and like i like every single person on the crew like i knew if their parents were dead or alive if mm -hmm. they were we had someone with Alzheimer's in their life. We talked about it. I talked about how do you wish to die? Like I had those kinds of conversations with everybody on the crew because I needed to feel like I have a safe space of intimacy where like my dad's really vulnerable here and I need you to know that I'm not just using him and I'm really vulnerable here. So I need to understand who are you? What do you understand about dementia? And, you know, it turned out like, whatever like 60 percent of the crew knew people with dementia yeah so instead of me worrying oh i gotta hide how my dad is behaving and make sure people don't know that that like i'm not impinging upon him in this moment like instead of hiding all of that it's like okay actually how many of us here have experience with dementia yeah and so you know the grip was just like treated my father exquisitely and and it was like restorative and and it was like it was repair work for him for someone that he had lost right to be gentle with my father you know like so stuff like that was going on on the set and like i cried we were laughing we were talking you know this is like and this is a giant whatever you know it's like a 45 person crew you know with lights and choreography and costume designers and makeup and you know a ton of stuff going on but we created like this space of love and like collaboration and and you still forget people still people are unseen in those things and it was like it was when i realized like oh the focus is impossible and i saw the focus guy chris just like uh and then i went to him i was like chris it's cool with me like a lot of things are going to be out of focus like dementia is being out of focus if it turns out everything is out of focus it's okay and I really felt that, which is crazy. <laughs> but you all would have said I was a genius if the whole heaven scene was out of focus. <laughs> <laughs> Instead, Chris was a genius because he put some of the things in focus. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no. no. Um, that that idea though of of like the sort of the essence of collaboration, like where we can all get into one groove together like a shared vision, a shared mission, fueled by love and gentleness. I mean, don't we all like fantasize about, and I think that's one of the reasons why people fall in love with filmmaking is when they get on set and they're with this group of people who finally click in, Yeah, it feels so good, right? Like, and we all crave that, you know, that sense of like shared vision, shared mission with love and gentleness. Like and having fun with it. Having fun and, and, having fun and, cool. and improvising and, ser right. and serendipity. Like, and, and you know, that, you that. <laughs> it, it lasts for a couple of days. It's ineffable. But, you know, back to like the real and people are asking, like, did you ever feel yeah. like you're running your dad? And yeah, totally. you know, watching the film and all of those kinds mm -hmm. of you know, things like, oh, that's real. And, you know, if anyone knows my work, like I'm obsessed with the ethics of documentary and like always questioning myself and like, you know, questioning what it is to attempt to represent another person and, you know, very aware how the history of cinema is full of like violent misrepresentation of people, like misrepresentation that has, you know, worked in the service of the horrors of the world, right? And, and, and you, you, you know, I, I think there's a person, I think Layla is talking about like, sort of having this like crushing feeling after the first documentary where 
she she didn't the people who she had filmed mm -hmm. they didn't have the same feelings that she expected to them to have and and you know it's like it's this powerful complicated relationship and in this case i i was able to take a lot of risks because my father trusted and loved me so much but also then that put a different kind of pressure on me of like how dare i like play with this most precious relationship right um but i do think i do think it's easier to um in some ways mess with your own pain than it is to like you know you don't want to disrespect other people's pain you have no right to do that um but it like your father your relationship with your father is yours you know and so you do get to mess with it in some way you, you know my, my brother my brother had some slightly different opinions on that right really oh interesting <laughs> well of course right it's his father too sure and right? yeah and right. certainly my mother never would have let me make this film with her right so you know like family is always is the the, oh, the conversations and the negotiations around what's possible are in a matrix of other people also in the mat that matrix i mean i know that one of the strands and themes working in the film is about multi-generations your father showing pictures of his grandmother to your children to his grandchildren and you realize that there's six generations or five generations um, and you're kind of, again, you're exploring the matrix of the family, but also time. And also we, at a certain point, we realize that both of your parents, you know, your father with dementia and your mother with Alzheimer's, and we wonder about how you feel about it all. And yeah, well, I'm telling you, like, on the one hand, like, I'm definitely getting it is <laughs> the way I feel. And then the other hand, I'm like, please, please come on, like, you know, medicine. But but we as we, you know, are in this COVID moment together, like, you know, we just know like so many people, like, you know, 500,000 people, like wrong place, wrong time. You know, they didn't have to die, but they did. You know, and we're not done yet. And I think like these stories where like people are like on the verge of getting the vaccine and then they get it, you're just like, oh. um, I'm really happy to report today that Marta is leaving the intensive care ward where she has been for the last three weeks with COVID. She was doing caregiving for a 97 year old and a 101 year old and they got it, they recovered, she didn't. She's been in the hospital for weeks. And, you know, it's just like, oh this this moment we're in like it's so you know it's it's responding to all this systemic stuff and you know the same people are getting nailed that get nailed on other things and it's also random right right so i think we're all deep in this both we're like self-protected and afraid we're not able to grieve because we're not able to be together we're you know, so many pe feelings people are experiencing. Um, and, yeah. you know, I like, I, I knew there was a lot of grief out there in the world before the pandemic happened when I made this film, because like, you know, if you have a parent with dementia, you just like traffic, you're just like in grief, you're just in ant anticipatory grief all the time. Yeah. Um, and I talked to someone in one of these, you know, zoom moments and they said grief never ends it just transforms right. and i was like oh they're so right like and grief is not only sadness like it's also remembering and like tapping into like i love this guy you know like and you know like whatever your mother would be doing in the next room if she were there right like sort of imagining you suddenly could imagine like all right when you leave this zoom you're gonna like imagine she's in the other room like doing something funny or doing something beautiful and like it's going to bring that bring her back to you that's grieving also so yeah. this like sort of like unburying and unburying the dead like just like so that they could come out to play again um can we inject that kind of joy into our grief because the yes. like full on like dead serious all the time will kill us <laughs> like day of the dead like the skeleton dancing Totally. <laughs> um, I think, let's see, 
I think I think we we've hit our we've hit our um our time. Yeah. We had such yeah. a just such a rich conversation. It's so fun to just to just follow follow where we wherever we go with it because it, it which seems really right for talking about Dick Johnson is dead. Totally. And Caroline, I do need you to say your parents' names. Oh yes, my mother Guy Libresco and my father Leonard Libresco. So tell me one, one thing about Guy and one thing about Leonard. My mother Guy named herself Guy um, at 21 when she went to France. Um, and she was brilliant and a psychotherapist. I forgot that. I knew that and I forgot that. That's so <laughs> awesome. Yeah, yeah. And, and my father, you know, the truth, I'll tell you something vulnerable in the truth. The poem mm. I Mm. My, I didn't know my father. Mm. My father left and raised another family um, when I was a, a child. And so that's my truth. That's, that's the, yeah. 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 And it's, we're, it's like, we're, we're laying it out. We're like, it's in lay the, it out, the, lay the, it out. The tradition of, in the tradition of storytelling and truth telling, right? In the story of truth telling. And also like when we speak these things, we also learn like, where's our need still? Yeah. yeah. Right. And I think that's the thing that, that like, this is what, what helps us make the choices we make in our lives is like, just like listening to like, where's the need? And what can I, what can I do with it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, um, I really appreciate that you're such a close listener to yourself so that this film and the, and the last film could, could emerge. So thank you for that. Mm, well, you, you know, from, you know, from Guy, you know, from listening, right? Like, and, your dad. <laughs> yeah. and, 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 you know, from absence, right? We learn things from absence as well as presence. And, you know, I think that we, I don't know, it's just like this, this lifelong, like fascinating journey of being like, oh this really matters to me now what am i gonna do <laughs> so i you know i i i thank you everyone um for coming and and i i have this thing you know i i do different things i have different shticks right like sometimes i ask people about how they wish to die and whatever but yeah. one of my shticks that i've like come along with is like if you say the sentence blank is dead yeah and you put the name of the person in that blank. Like if you say Guy is dead. Yeah. The thing that is like unbearable. And so this might be a person who's alive or a person who's already dead. Like put that person's name there yeah. and just like sit with what that does to you. And it might not be true yet. It will be true someday. Mm -hmm. And just imagine like, is there anything that I can make mm. to honor how much feeling there is in saying that sentence? And, you know, just like, I don't know what it is. Like I did it the other day. I just like made a little, like a little, I'll just bring it on my board. <laughs> I love whatever she has behind her there that like, there's a lot going on. Like a pink like a metal board of ideas. But someone, someone was saying the word, they just said irreplaceable. And I just like, wrote it down for myself and I was like yeah that's what he is irreplaceable yeah. and somehow this has like been helping me like yeah. he is irresponsible he is dead and he is irreplaceable mm -hmm. yeah. so so that's my that's my like wish that I send out to everyone is like just make something for yourself in relation to that sentence that is unbearable and impossible and there's some solace in saying it in some way just saying it out, out loud right yeah 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 thank you we, 
We could go on all evening. This is so yeah. fun. I wish we were all together with, with this audience. That would oh, be, man, it would be amazing. So I, would love to all. I wish I could see what everyone was wearing. Know what you like, look like. And also yeah. we could be in like a living room together and just talking oh, about life. stuff and talking okay. about grief and uh, art and grief. Art Thank and you. grief. And um, I guess Maggie's going to come back on. So um, let's. I'm going to rejoin you. Please do. Yes. If I can turn my camera back on. Here we go. You guys, <laughs> I think you I think you stirred up a lot of stuff for a lot of us who are listening here tonight. And I really appreciate it. I know I'm going to have a, a really beautiful night because of this. Mm -hmm. And I, I sort of think let's do it again at Vidiots when we open our doors in Eagle Rock. Oh, and that'll be get you out here, Kirsten, and we'll add your movie to your your shelf. And thank you so much, Netflix, for putting um, it together. Um, we really appreciate it, you guys. I hate to be the one to to click the end button, but I will. Oh, I love it. But we'll be together in the future. I we'll love it. In the future. Together um, in community. Together in community and cinema. Thank all you right. all so much. Love Have a great night, all. you guys. Bye. Bye. Maggie, thanks to the audience. Thanks, everybody. I see an amazing thing in the chat. I got to take a picture of it before everything disappears. Hold oh, on. Yeah, take a picture of it. <laughs> Wonderful message from Layla. Got it. <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody.